Today's episode is a slightly different episode than the typical slow-mo. Uh, it is not the most optimistic and at the same time, it might turn a little bit political. It is, however, uh, an episode that contains quite a bit of what I believe is the truth of our present and uh, an indication of our future. Uh, please remember that it is not the events of your life that stress you. It's the way that you deal with them that does. Is As part of our uh, little mini series of uh, uh, stress, we are attempting to show you some of the challenges that you can be facing in our world today and how you can deal with them better. I hope you find this eye-opening. I hope you don't take all of it as truth, but perhaps as my or some of my guests' truth. And in a way, look for your own and start to prepare. I'm very grateful for giving me the opportunity to have such a variety of guests on this show. Uh, by the way, if you want to see Basim's uh, tour, uh, it's available in the show notes. So please go ahead and take a look at that. My guest today is Basim Youssef. Uh, Slow-mo is never a political show, but I don't think Basim covers a political topic. Uh, Basim uh, has been for uh, fellow Middle Easterns, um, a beacon of hope back in 2011 when he started his show on YouTube, uh, became a mega TV star uh, during the Arab Spring. Uh, Basim had a show called Al Bernamig, uh, the first satire in uh, the Middle East and probably the last, I would say, <laughs> where we for the first time could see someone on TV uh, openly discussing his views, openly discussing what he believes uh, in with humor. I mean, humor is a big part of what we do in the Middle East. Um, let me just say, uh, post the Arab Spring uh, back in 2013, uh, Basim had to pay dearly uh, for expressing his views. Uh, he uh, was accused of multiple things, sometimes by the society, sometimes by the government, eventually had to uh, flee to um, California, I think at the beginning, and then LA. Um, I met Basim for the first time in 2015, uh, back in California, when it wasn't a good time. Uh, when he had left his career as a very successful surgeon for 20 years to start his uh, uh, comedy satire, what achieved 30 million viewers weekly uh, in no time at all, and then suddenly was forced uh, into silence and out of his home. Um, I've probably rarely ever met anyone that paid so dearly for his right to express his views. And uh, uh, recently, uh, Bassem appeared on the Piers Morgan show uh, post uh, the Gaza events and uh, shared his views very, very openly and very accurately, I would probably say. Uh, and once again, uh, while he now is getting the hearts and ears of a lot of people. He's also getting a ton of, of pushback and and uh, struggle, uh, let's just say. Uh, in a world where we are no longer uh, able to uh, express our views freely unless they align with the views that are supposed to be expressed, I wonder if we have any freedom at all. And uh, Slow-mo is not a political show. This is a humanitarian show. And I will tell you openly that the biggest humanitarian um, dilemma we're about to face, especially in the age of the rise of artificial intelligence and deep fake, is uh, what is the truth anymore? And what what right do we have to express our truth? So uh, a dear friend, um, a hero. Uh, <laughs> uh, please don't stop, continue. <laughs> Tell me more, please yeah. feed my ego. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, that's a very good intro. Uh -huh. We need 10 more minutes of this. <laughs> exactly, and then, and then we finish the show. And that. then we finish the show, it's like, thank you very much. That was Basim Yusuf. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Like my, my it's it's early in the morning. Mm -hmm. That was my breakfast for my ego. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know where to go from here. It's like, it's only downhill from here. Let's 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 actually go to your, <laughs> let's go to your ego, right? Ego ego is actually easily fed because I, I actually want to start from that moment where you're, you're successful, but you're not known. And suddenly everyone in your home country knows you, like mm. 30 million people. How did that feel, that rise of 
to fame. Well, let me tell you first something about ego. Mm. What I actually get, like came to me right now as we're talking about ego. I think the bigger your ego, the more fragile it is. This is the only thing that the bigger mm. and the bigger and inflated it is, the weaker it is. Can you imagine? Yeah, I just thought any, about that. If anyone pokes it, it, yeah, it collapses it, it, it immediately. Is crazy. Yeah. The bigger your ego, the yeah. weaker it is. The yeah. more vulnerable it is, the more... Uh, uh, susceptible it is to being insulted or being uh, uh, or, or or feeling small, which yeah. is crazy. The which bigger your the ego, time, doesn't it? Yeah, the bigger your ego, the smaller you are. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> no, that's incredible. Actually. I just came yeah. up with this. Well, that's, uh, well, I should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you, you, should, you should write a book. You you did have it. You did do a talk. Uh, I saw you do a talk about ego. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's. Yeah. Uh, I think ego is. Uh, I've been. Um, because I have had, uh, I've been into uh, situations for the past uh, 13 years where the ego is the center of the talk. As you just asked me, what does it feel to be like overnight success, go on the shoot, this shooting of fame and exposure is, is um, uh, can, can do two, one of two things for, with, for you. It can either uh, intoxicate you completely. Mm. And uh, because it's this kind of like uh, unlimited ad- ad- adoration and, and praise from people, I mean, it has to do something for you, or it makes you scared. Mm. And I was scared because I got famous very quickly at the age of 38, 39, end mm. of my 30s, after being humiliated as a heart surgeon and <laughs> residencies for forever, because, you know, in, 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 in uh, like, being a heart surgeon and growing up, uh, and see, and being have all of these seniors abusing me, abusing you all day, all <laughs> week. True. Yeah, and this is why doctors have a, a god complex because if you go through all of that, it's like oh, it's my turn now to be a god. <laughs> okay. So I I I I left mid level when I was like a, was, a, when a, you were a mini not god. A god yet. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like a mini god. <laughs> but I hated that. I hated that kind of ego trip. That's why I never actually fit into surgery. You actually opened people's chests and played with their hearts. Like you- well, I, I, I always say, I, I, people used to pay me to stab them in the chest, <laughs> legally. Yeah, <laughs> it is a, this is a, a very weird change of career, isn't I, it? I know, but, yeah. but, but, but back to your thing, like this whole rise, uh, I, it, it, it got me scared. And I remember I was, uh, my, our director at the time, Mohammed Khalifa, he was the director of the Bernamik, the show and he, he, he whenever we go into a public place and people come and commemorate i would he feel he look at me and i'll come very sad it's like what's wrong with you man why don't you enjoy it and i said i told him this is not real man mm-hmm. this is not real it's going to be taken away from me and it happened of course so when it was when it did <clears throat> as much as as it was for it felt very bad but i i was a little bit grounded mm-hmm. so because i uh, i i didn't believe and i didn't accept that kind of uh <clears throat> fame that came overnight uh, and then it's happening now again with the with, with the, the exposure right, of of after the interviews but it, it's just uh fame is very fragile and very toxic and very dangerous and it's it doesn't um, uh, there's two parts of it there's the part that you feel your ego you feel big which is dangerous in, in itself but it's also the part of like too much exposure and too much expectations so you feel that you're scrutinized yeah. you, t- you mentioned the 30 million people watching every episode and i would say like that's not do you think it's good you know what does it mean it means that 30 million people have an opinion about you Correct. have an opinion about everything that you say Correct. every action that you do is scrutinized it yeah. is it is analyzed it is dissected uh, that's not a way to live but it's also a very interesting way to to disseminate to 30 million people something that you believe in. So yes, it's lovely. I'm not saying that it's all bad, but it comes with the, with the caveat, it comes with a price. And the price you pay from your own uh, humanity and your own 100%. Your, your own way, it's it's not normal. It's 100%. not normal to, uh, to, to have that kind of exposure, to have that kind of fame overnight, to have that kind of adoration from all of these people because adoration comes with a tax and that tax is expectation. That expectation might not be met at a certain point. Will and that met. Lo- love, yeah. and I've experienced that very much when I left Egypt, that love can turn into hate overnight. So that is the worst thing. So that's why yeah, you try to separate yourself mm. from that uh, mood because it's not real. But still, yeah, Bassem, when, you, you know, so, so we're starting here in the morning, we're in London. And uh, yeah, you, you sat in a co- in a cafe around the corner with Abbas, and we just had a chat, and right, and it's you, you're you're behaving very unfame like, and mm-hmm. I can guarantee you that as you're walking the streets of London, you get interrupted by a lot of people. Some will love you, some will hate you, and that's not a very um, 
it's not a very normal reaction to fame. I know a lot of famous people who will not show up in a public place at all. Mm. Why do you choose to do that? Well, because uh, maybe in London, not many people know me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, no, because like, I, 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 if, listen, if you start uh, uh, acting unnatural, your life become unnatural. Correct. And you should not change your life just because you have a little bit of fame. What what will happen? People will come and take pictures with you. That's just something that I appreciate. And if that makes it, if 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 clicking a picture with me makes someone happy, uh, who am I to say no? That's actually mm. something very nice, mm. and it's lovely to give. Sometimes it's of course it's overwhelming. It's too much of a crowd to place, whatever. But I mean, I I don't feel famous. This whole thing about like fame is um, is made up, and it's uh, and it's unnatural. Uh, so and it will be taken away from me anytime. So it, you bet. It, I think it's better to. Why, ground why do you, you believe that? Because first of all, because nothing is because everything is temporary. Yeah, fame is temporary. Success is temporary. Failure is temporary. Sadness is temporary. Happiness is temporary. So true. Everything is temporary. Yeah. So when you deal with life as uh, as a temporal mode, things will be better. And I think that our anxiety comes from the fact that we don't want, I mean, we say that to ourselves, but like our anxiety always makes us worried about like what will happen in the future, what will happen if that, if, if that success could be maintained, if the failure could, not, could be avoided. I, I think if you, and, and we, we, we all talk about this cliche about living in the moment, enjoying what it is, but it is very difficult to apply. Hmm. I, I have to say, Abbasim, if you'll let me uh, just say something personal, that the Basim I met in 2015 is very different than this one. How so? I feel... Am I more puffed? I you muscular? are more puffed. Are you still vegan? Yes. Seriously? Oh, Allah. You're, you're, try, you're, you're proving a point here. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, and I talk about that openly, every, every now and then I cheat because I travel a lot and yeah. I can't maintain yeah. the vegan. And I feel the difference from my body when I'm not. Like I was just like traveling with my buddy Ahmed Abbas here and uh, uh, and I, I go out with him and sometimes he'll, he'll see me like switch to pescatarian. Mm -hmm. But then to, to the answer, and then we met in the tour here and he said, are you, he noticed that like I changed again. It's like, are you going to go for vegan? It's like, yeah, man, I mean, when I, when I, when I drop off the wagon, mm -hmm. vegan, I feel bad. I feel terrible in my body and I have to go back. So when we, when we met in California, this was going to be your sort of next big gig, you're trying to talk about being vegan and the benefits of that. But also I have to say, when you asked me how you changed, the best time I met in California was very, I don't know the word, you were, you were still fighting really hard. Mm. Now I feel you're a lot more in acceptance of who you are, what you stand for, what the world looks at you like, and you're, you're a lot more in harmony with, with, the, with the shit of life. Well, you know, 2014, 2015, a lot of us have were in a different oh, place at the time, time because this were like our dreams and hopes yeah. about the, the new era of Egypt were destroyed. Yeah. Remember so, that day after Mubarak stepped down yeah, yeah. and, and the, everyone was cleaning the streets? Yes, that was absolutely. the most hopeful day of my life. Absolutely. But then, yeah. then, then you get, again, we're talking about like the flip. Yeah. The love to hate, the hope to despair. Correct. So we were in that kind of despair. There was a lot of anger. Yeah. I, I uh, when you met me, 2015, I, I was filled with anger, with bitterness, with disappointment, feeling of betrayal, <clears throat> feeling of uh, absolute fear of the future. Uh, in, in, uh, and then you went to the U.S. with nothing. Yeah, I had nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And um, I, I escaped, and I, you had to build that from all. So I, I had to earn money. So I would go and do these speeches in colleges. I I created a live show that was very bad, very bad, <laughs> terrible. I mean, you were not I very would, happy, I, right? I, 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 I wouldn't watch it. Yeah. It was all, it was a recycle of, of the... Of dynamic. a dynamic, yeah. It was a recycling of what I did. It was basically reminiscing of, of the story. And, I, and then at a certain... And it was not bad. And I know that a lot of people came in and they were disappointed, and they rightly so. So, I, and, and, and I, 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 I didn't know what to do. And mm. that's why it took me like three, four years of complete confusion in the States until I started doing stand-up comedy. And even that I sucked big time. And it took me a, a time to kind of like come back and actually have a decent show that I can travel with. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I was dealing with a lot of anger and bitterness in my life, of course. And, um, uh, I, and I, maybe, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more adaptive right now. 
Uh, more, more uh, calm and peaceful. Okay, I, I, I want to go to the tough bit, if you don't mind me to, yeah, to yeah, yeah. going there. I mean, it's nice. I mean, instead of like paying for therapy. No, I'm not, no, not the tough bit of you, the tough bit of our I mean, so it's of already like a therapy setting. I can, I can like change Yeah, yeah why now. don't you lie down? And yeah, said, yeah like, exactly. Why me, don't you down, lie down? Tell me about your uh, childhood. <laughs> <laughs> <the best one>. Exactly. <laughs> I actually never speak publicly about that because I actually am not... Uh, you know, I don't associate with any specific ethnicity or specific. I mean, I love all of humanity. I want everything to be right, right? I'm so sorry for you, man. I love yeah. all of humanity. You're yeah. be disappointed, man. Uh, you, humanity you, you, is very disappointing. And humanity is disappointing? Of course. Why, why you know, would you, you know say the, that? the famous saying, humans hmm? are terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but, but, but think, think, why would you say that? Most of humanity is not disappointing. Most of humanity is just trying to make ends meet, trying to get by. Some of humanity is pieces of shit. And they are the ones in charge. And they are the ones in charge. Yeah. So basically, uh, you, can, you can judge humanity by its direction in total. And the direction in total of humanity is very disappointing. That I I hundred percent agree, right? Mm. But but you know how many of of us? I, I'll I'll use a non political example. How many of us will go and shoot kids in school, and how many of us will disapprove of school shootings? Oh, uh, how many of us see that the problem of school shooting and don't do anything about it? Okay, that's because exactly it, where I want it, to go. Exactly because yeah. it is because it is you just complicit because you let people who are very openly evil, do whatever they want, and they you find justification in your mind to let it go. So I'll, I'll tell you, when I, when, I, uh, when I was writing my third book, I attempted to do a bit of mathematics about what is the cause, of, the, the biggest cause of the decline of humanity. And it wasn't the evildoers. If you do the mathematics of it, it was the complacence. It was the rest of us sitting there and doing absolutely nothing. Right. It was us saying, yeah, you know what? The climate is going to decline anyway. What would my uh, next plastic bag do or what would my next drive uh, do? Uh, it's, not, it's not within my hands. And, and I think this, when I say let's go to the tough bit, that this to me is where the world is, is heading. Is, is it, it, from one side, we are not informed. From the other side, when we're informed, we're distracted. From the third side, when we're distracted, we engage in silly conversations, beating each other, not the real event. And eventually we do nothing about it, okay? Uh, you somehow continue to pop up like the Kurvisami for Orlos, right? Mm -hmm. You continue to pop up in the world and say, no, that shouldn't be the way you know, politicians shouldn't be allowed to do this, uh, you know, war shouldn't be allowed to do to be like that, and so on. So, yeah, uh, somebody in, a, in an Arabic show once said, Basim Yusuf, he flourishes during revolutions and wars. I was like, dude, <laughs> dude, what the hell, you're just like ruining my repeat. Am, am I a bad woman? You're just like, what, what is this? What, is but, it? what kind of introduction but, is that? <laughs> but you, but you, but you, sor you sort of actually, I think you sort of hold yourself until the position, that the, the situation is not, bearable anymore. I, I don't, I, listen, I have absolutely no plan or, or no idea why do I pop up like this. It happened in the revolution and it resonated with people. It happened. The last thing I would have ever, ever thought that I would be talking about is the Palestinian Israeli conflict because it is the most chronic and I have effectively and deliberately stayed away from that conflict because it's chronic and there's no point of talking about it. And then I found myself in the middle of it. Mm. And even when I go and get invited to shows, I go to shows to promote my coming shows. Mm -hmm. But then they they bring it up, so I have to respond. Mm. So now I have been put I, I'm, in. I'm this... about to bring it up. So. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, it's, yeah. it's fine. But like the the fact is that you are being put in a position that you didn't ask for. I mean, I talked about like I was invited three times on Piers Morgan to discuss that topic. I said no, and then when I went up, suddenly everybody is asking me to talk about it. But then now I have to get prepared because I was not educated about the issue. I'm not like a, an, an expert about the conflict of the Middle East, absolutely not. But then I found myself, it's, it's like when I started my show in Egypt, I didn't know a single thing about how to do a television show, mm. but I found myself into it, so I had to, to teach myself how to do it. Mm. Same way with this, now I'm into it, and I, you cannot you cannot escape it. You cannot like you, you, know, yeah. uh, you cannot be like. What do you think about what uh, Israel is like? I don't I don't want to talk about. You can't you can't. You suddenly you're now into that position. Mm. So now you have to educate yourself and be knowledgeable. And then before I know it, in six months, I go on debates with people who have been discussing this for twenty years, and I am bringing uh, like point of views that are quite formidable.
Mm. So I don't know how it, this happens. I just you just find yourself in the middle of it. You you do bring points of views that I, I that I want to expand into quite a bit of our future in general, not just that, that conflict, but the reality of the matter is that we are not told the truth. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is? Have you seen this movie Idiosyncrasy? Uh, have I? Idiocracy or idiocracy? Idiocracy or idiocracy? What idiu? Idiocracy? Yeah, idiocracy. Idiocracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is such a a representation. This is this is this is like when this movie came out, it was a flop, and then it became a cult movie. Yeah. And they, I, I can even remember one of the behind the scenes, the way that this movie was made, is that they, they wanted to find a footwear that was so grotesque, (laughs) that was so ugly, that it it, it is like, and they would make this as the uh, the sign of the future, and they found Crocs. Yeah, exactly. And they said like- (laughs) And it is the sign of the future. And the thing is like, they did it, and they bought like 500 pairs of it, and it's like, nobody will ever, Mm. will ever wear this, this is so ridiculous, and it became our reality now. Yeah. So it is, um, uh, the thing is, we are hyper informed to to the point that we are not informed anymore. Explain. You have a, a device in your hand that can give you any kind of information you have in the world. But I don't know if it's the algorithm or it's because of our habits, people are, people are more stupid. Mm. You will never imagine that like when you have like an internet, you have like a whole community that think that flat earth is real. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that can give you the epitome of like the stupidity of that. You have all of the information, but it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, you have the information, people are informed, people react, go into the streets, go into marshes, but things don't change. Because Absolutely. at the end of the day, it's the people of power who are basically giving you the middle finger. It's like, I don't care. Yeah, I'm doing it anyway. Yeah, you engage in your show, and you get can, your you energy can engage, out there. You can get anger, you can wave your flags, you can shout at us in rallies. It doesn't matter. So, it, and I think what happened recently just gives you like an idea of what is the Western world is made of. It's basically people, it is the same way between like China and Russia where nobody can speak and and the government does everyone, everything they want. Here, the government still does everything it wants and you can shout about it. Yeah. And you can enjoy your freedom of expression, but it doesn't mean anything anymore Mm. because freedom of expression really stops at the expression. Mm. But it doesn't really go up to changing policies because how many, how, because you cannot compete with the money that is being poured by special interest groups and lobbies and pharmaceutical companies and uh, military industrial conflicts and uh, the APAC law, lobby and the NRA and whatever. I mean, and not, not a single person that is living in the United States can approve of, of school shooting uh, for our point in the beginning. Mm. And yet you have the half of the lobby. country, yeah. Kind Absolutely no problem with NRA like buying the politicians right in front of your eyes. They're buying politicians right in front of your eyes and you're not doing anything about it. How is that a democracy? How is that? that so it's basically the, the message is you can speak and you can cry and you can shout as much as you want. I will do exactly what I want, but we have free speech. Mm. This is the bigger issue of uh, the Western world because we come to the Western world like, yes, I left the Middle East. I can speak. I can say everything. I'm like, yeah, good. Say Go whatever ahead, say. you want. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. And if you say too much, we're going to accuse you of certain things and end your career. What do you mean? I mean, you're going to accuse you of whatever. You can accuse you of patriotic, you're, you're anti Semitic, you're uh, anti this, anti that, anti that, you're right. And then you're going to lose your career. And we've seen people losing their career. Ha, losing have you, their, have their you struggled with some of that? I mean, I talked about it. I, I lost a, a, a role in Superman, the new movie. Oh, the, you were going to be the next Superman. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, not the next Superman. Yeah. I was one of the villains. But, you know, I, I, of course, it was like a misunderstanding and I understood and I released a video. It's like, fine, guys, it's fine. It's like, yeah. It just, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter anymore. And um, I don't know, that's, that's, the, that's the idea of like answering question about like, we're in, are we are we are so much informed, but yet we don't know anything. So, so the, this whole facade of, yeah, you have those platforms, you can say whatever you want, you can st- walk in the streets. And, and you can sh- be shadow banned and you can have the algorithm like curbing the reach of your content. 100%, so, right? So at the end of the day, you're just like shouting in your echo chamber and it doesn't matter. So, so no hope, you think? I don't know. Why, you, why do you continue to shout then? Because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> if that's the only freedom I have, at, at, at least uh, consider it as a, as a release. 
منتل اورجازم <laughs> I, 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 have to, I have to say, Yabasim, Anna, I have struggled with that quite a bit because mm. I'm 100% with you. I'm very, I'm very mathematical in my approach to things, right? My wonderful daughter is quite, uh, you know, passionate about making things better and she goes out and she shares and she joins the rallies and she does, does whatever for whatever cause, anything that is unjust, right? And I, and I keep saying, but baby, when did it change? Like, did, did Black Lives Matter you know, protect black lives? Not really. Did, you know, Me Too stop women being abused? Not really. Did, you know, the, the, do the rallies around stopping killing children in any of the civilized, you know, civilian populations in the world, Gaza, uh, uh, you know, Ukraine, whatever, did that change anything? No, right? But you can't, you can't tell me that that's it and we're going to have to live that way because it doesn't seem, uh, you know, that, that this is, that this is the end of uh, of humanity. I think the challenge is probably on our side in terms of realizing that this is not working to find something else to do. Yes, but to do what? Because you see what you just said, basically give, it's, that's the, exactly what they want us to feel. There's no point. I think that's, uh, maybe it's by design. Because you, you like you watch like Kirby, the, the spokesman of, uh, uh, of the White House, he said, dude, like Israel just killed people. It's like, yeah, they were investigating. They, they don't mean to. It's fine. <laughs> they don't mean to. They don't mean to. Uh, I'm sure there's an investigation. Let's just wait for the investigation. But they did it before. Yeah, I know. But they said they were at fault. It's just, you know, they said, like, yeah, we're doing it. <laughs> you don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. I mean, it's just like it's very frustrating. But and And whether or not you talk about it, well, what else we can do? That's the only thing that's left for us. Whether or not it changes, I have no idea. I have to say your speech, was it in India somewhere? Yeah. I think that was very, very targeted into what we can do, right? I think the reality is maybe instead of highlighting the issues, you should highlight the system. That mm. the system is screwing with us, mm. right? That the, 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 the illusion of expression is not there. You, you just spoke about that. Mm -hmm. That the, uh, you know, that, that, Democracy is not really a democracy, okay? If you have, if the people have no impact on policy, then where is the democracy? That the, uh, you know, that the, uh, um, the, 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 the separation, the divide between us that, you know, um, puts us against each other is just a, um, a means to disperse our energy into shit that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and accordingly, maybe people should start to investigate the truth a little more and maybe people should speak uh, uh, firmly about one truth and not get distracted. And, and I think this is where we go wrong. Where we go wrong is we, you know, we, we follow the trends. So, you know, there is a, an, a conflict that we're interested in and we just go and fight for that conflict. And then three weeks later, there is a football star that moves from team A to team B. We go talk about the football star. I think they, dep they, I think they rely on you getting uh, bored. Because you, yeah, uh, because the thing is, how many times you're gonna uh, single out or point out the atrocities? Yeah, how many times you sing and uh, it's wrong? How many times you're gonna say? So it, it works like this. Let's say let's not talk about something trending, about something that happens. Like for example, uh, money in politics mm. that is not trending. That mm. happens every single day. You talk about money in politics, and you take like certain lobbies. They pay they pay their politicians. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's so bad, man. Second day, they're paying politicians. Oh, yeah, man, it's like it's terrible. They're paying politician, dude. Halas, man, it's not. Mm. So basically, people become complicit because they get bored of saying like, "Are you still same way with Israel?" It's like, yeah, okay, we 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 bombed we the spoke about we, it. we bombed the hospital. We already talked about that. Let's move on. We killed kids. So what? I mean, like, are you gonna say this every day? We're done. So, so this whole thing about like, it is the, I, I call it the banality of evil. Hmm. It is so, it is so there it, and, 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 and it doesn't change. So you keep talking about it and then people get bored because you, you, you keep shouting about it and they don't care because they are not directly affected by it or they think they, they're not, you know, they, of course they are directly affected and it happens to them and then they start screaming and then people next to them is like, enough, man, we already heard you the first time. You don't need to repeat yourself. So they continue, they basically, the people in power continue, uh, I think they rely on the fact that people just going to get bored and move on. And it is very apparent in the war that's happening. It's very apparent in the, 
what's happening in politics, what happened, the way that we make our decisions. Just people get, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's enough, man. I, I, I think the most, I, the biggest eye opener for me is what happened with COVID. Mm. So, so the, you, we were all locked down. There was so much, uh, uh, you know, debate and shouting and the, the statistics showing up every day in the newspaper and it's rising and it's declining and uh, uh, here in the United Kingdom specifically. And then literally one week, that chart was missing from the newspapers. And then the following week, that chart was not there. And no one was talking about COVID anymore. No one actually ever came out and made an announcement and said, hey, by the way, the numbers declined. We're doing really well. Everything's free. Yeah. I don't understand what happened with COVID. I mean, like I'm a big promo- proponent of vaccination. Yeah. And I believe that maybe vaccination has helped people. Maybe the reason that we don't talk about it is that <clears throat> we did actually have developed uh, some sort of a uh, community immunity to it. And that's why we have, uh, we still have infections, but it comes like a common cold. I, don't, I mean, the thing is, like, now we're talking about conspiracy and whatever. I mean, at the time, we saw how the hospitals were cramped and how people could not No, I'm not talking about conspiracy. I'm, uh, to, I'm talking about the attention of humanity. Okay? Yeah, but I think but I think it wasn't affecting you anymore as it was. That's why people are paying more attention to the things that affect their lives. At one point, moment, COVID affected you. You couldn't leave the house. You couldn't get a place in the hospital. And the second moment, it, it not the second moment, it went over, over a month. I don't know. I don't have any any explanation for that. Do, do you think that the world is going to have more of what we just spoke about or less going forward? Where, where do you think we'll be? More of what? More of being, um, of being led by politicians that will do whatever they want. Of course. Even. No, of course. I think that because the world the population is increasing. And if you have that many people, you need to control them more effectively. And how the way to you affect masses of people, you affect them, you, uh, you control them by fear and misinformation and creating common enemies and creating conflicts. Uh, and I think it would get even worse because we as humans are becoming more destructive and more effective in killing other people. And more uh, killing has become very available and very easy and and it's been done very remotely too with all the technology mm-hmm. so now there's always the, this kind of guilt is being removed because you just like can kill masses of people when you're away and it's very it dangerous. feels like a video, video game really yeah it's very yeah. dangerous it's mm-hmm. very dangerous like i mean at the time be, be like 200 years ago 100 years ago there were like an effort made in order to kill more people but now that effort is not there and it's uh, it's very easy it's available and it's a touch of a button and this is the crazy thing about like uh, technology now that it's uh, 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 killing become normalized, casualties become normalized, human suffering become normalized as as long as you're on the other side of the screen. And uh, it's scary what's going to happen. Give me hope. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no hope? No hope. No hope arise. Would you would you believe it? I share that. Oh uh, yeah. I, I share I share that there is a very uh, significant shift because of the shift of power, really, because technology is accelerating at a pace that is unheard of in our lifetime. I'm I worked at Google for twelve years. We were advancing at blazing speed. The the speed now is ten times that. Mm. Right, and I think what is about to happen is because between geopolitical uh conflicts you know my, my my real issue is that conflict really is not the reason for war conflict is the alibi that you create to start a war mm-hmm. right and and you know this is uh this has been um the sign of our lives i think from ukraine uh russia ha- has been the beginning of yeah l- people can now go to another country and do other things and it's, go- it's, it's going to be about thing. conflicts about greed it, greed, greed is the is the is the driving force of all human conflict, and, and conflict is the facade. Yeah, if, I mean, I think the thing is like because we are having so many people, less resources, and people on top want to f- get fed, and uh, it's it's like uh, on a micro level. Imagine a country without mentioning any names that has a military dictatorship. In order for a president imagine. to have all of the uh, to be protected, he have to feed. The military, the police, and the judges. You know, this is this is this is the playbook of any uh, military junta. And then they they start like scooping resources and money from the public and giving it to those people because these are the people who protect his interests. 
And at a certain point, you will have the economy failing because there is not enough money to feed all of these powerful people. And then the, the, you see that the, the economy declining in front of you. Same thing now with happening in the world. You have uh, little resources, more people increasing, and you have a split of the rich and poor getting more, and the rich want to get richer, they want more tax breaks, they want to buy back their shares, they want to more, more and more and more, and technology is giving us more luxury, more exclusivity, more stuff. Yeah, and, and more uh, protection. Uh, more because, protection. Yeah, I want yeah, yeah. my own private jet. I want my my own island, bigger island. And and you have all of those people. They are like in the billions, but they continue to increase. And that that gives them more power and more of a protection from the rest of the masses. You know, the the mob. So basically, it's about people that want to increase their money. And there is no reason to have all of these wars right now in the world, other than to feed the military industrial complex. In whether in the United States or Europe or Russia or whatever, yeah, and uh, base, as if they are, they are, they need to create that war in order because yes, if they're exactly. gonna create all of these weapons, <laughs> they need to use it and yeah. they need to be more effective, more damaging, more expensive, and that's why uh, there is. I talked about that before in one of uh, the interviews about there is a, a thirty minutes uh, piece, sorry, sixty minutes uh, episode. Uh, about the price gouging of the defense, uh, the 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 Pentagon, mm. uh, the Ministry of Defense in the United States, and how they uh, th- there was used to be more than fifty uh, uh, suppliers, and now they conglomerated into five. Wow! And that created a monopoly. Mm. So, like a, a, a ga- uh, like an oil uh, pressure valve that used to uh, cost thirty dollars, now it costs ten thousand mm. dollars. It's crazy. Mm. No, sorry, 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 $329 to $10,000. Mm. And they, in 2006, the whole fleet of the Apache fleet of the United States and Iraq was grounded because of a safety valve they couldn't get from Raytheon mm. because they, 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 they gouged the prices. Mm. So do you have, uh, you have tanks that are being produced in the hundreds and the US military are not using them and they're leaving them to rust in the desert. So basically they are producing I think that's Arm a good thing. And Let weapons, mm-hmm. yeah, but like they're producing all of this money that comes from the military, but from the budget of the United States, which is over eight hundred and fifty billion dollars, which is more than sixty six percent of the military, but of the total budget of the United States. They're running us into more deficit. They're running us into more need, and that for weapons that we will never need, and we're just doing it because of special interest. So this is this is this is crazy. And at a certain point, you produce that weapons, and you will actually need a, a certain war to to to, to, to throw yeah. all of these weapons into it, and you produce it again. It just it's um, it's uh, it's that's not sustainable. Do you believe we're heading into a bigger war? Ah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, World War Three. I don't know, three, or maybe it's the final destination. Mm-hmm. World War, the final, sep- <laughs> final <laughs> chapter. I have no idea, man. I mean, like you have you have war, you have climate change, you have limited resources, you have problems that- have artificial like Africa, intelligence and, and- And you have uh, AI. Yeah, that's and- uh, Go and screw all of us. There is value in making people see what is actually happening. Yes. Oh, I, I had here on this show, Stephen Jenkinson, uh, a philosopher from Canada. Uh, who, uh, 70 some years old, hmm? uh, used to be um, a philosopher, psychologist, very, 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 very deep and wise, became a um, farmer. Uh, uh, unlike another uh, Canadian philosopher? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 very, very. I mean, we're uh, not mentioning name, Jordan Peterson. No, 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 no names. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, the um, the he. I asked him. He he spent 30 years of his life attending to people who are dying. Okay, mm. and I asked him, and I said, I said, Stephen, he, we started the conversation. I was basically saying, you know, farming. That's one of my lifetime time dreams. Maybe when I'm done with my work, I can go and retire and farm. And he said, mm. that would be a horrible idea. And I said, why? And he said, because farming used to be to time yourself with with the, with the climate so that you maximize your harvest. The climate is no longer predictable. Everything is going wrong. Uh, and and I asked him, and I said, but give me hope. And he said, hope is the wrong premise. Ah, interesting. Okay, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, look, when you're working with someone who's dying or who has the probability of dying, you tell them openly, 
look, you're diagnosed with this, you need to work on this, you need to change that. You know, you don't give them false hope. You don't, you don't wish that the world will change. You actually take action to try and change yourself, right? And I, I have to say, I mean, I say that with a lot of calm, but the truth is it is interesting times. Geopolitical issues are, are exploding. You know, economics are not in a good place. Um, you know, technology, whether AI or synthetic biology, is completely out of control. Are heading into a place where it's out of control, and climate, and, and the climate, of course. And I think my biggest one is what what I wanted to talk to you about all day today is the is the idea of the end of the truth. Is that we're not informed. We're not being. We're not able. We're. We're like. Like you said. We're too informed, to the point that we are not informed at all. Well, I mean, or maybe that we are too informed, but it doesn't matter because the people in power look at you and say they don't care about what kind of information. But there know? must be a way out of this. I don't know what it is, but like, listen, uh, I, I'm talking about this in all of the interviews I'm saying because it's been boggling my mind. Uh, there's an, uh, a very interesting documentary called uh, Praying for Armageddon. I really, I really recommend you watching mm. it. It's a two-part documentary. It's already on uh, on YouTube. It's a Norwegian uh, uh, director, and he talks about all of the right-wing fanatics that in the American government that are waiting for the second uh, arrival of Jesus, this, the rapture and all of that, and how they are supporting Israel, not from a political point of view, but from purely a religious point a of religious view. Point. They hate the Jews. They think all Jews will be killed when Jesus will come, or if not converted, while the, the Israelis or the Jews believe that the second it's the coming of the Messiah, not Jesus, because Jesus is actually fake. And uh, when it comes, all everybody will be enslaved by the Jews. And all of that will lead to Armageddon and the end of time. And that they are pushing for American forces to be in the Middle East so they would like receive whatever missile from anywhere so it will start a war. So you have people, the greatest country in the world, the richest country in the world, the strongest country in the world is actively pushing for the end of times. And you have the interviews with those people and people are like, what do you think? Or like, uh, don't you think that this is a controversial issue? These are Congress people. These are like heads of committees inside Congress and the Senate. And they say, I don't think it's com uh, controversial. I think uh, when Jesus will come, I'll be here waiting for him. And you have ministers, evangelical ministers preaching to army, uh, army soldiers in their training camps. You're basically creating like uh, Christian nationalist, uh, 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 extremist warriors that are ready to launch a holy war on the world at any moment. And people were afraid of ISIS. People were afraid of Qaeda. You're having like people who are actively wanting to end the world. That if that's the, and these are people with their with their fingers on on buttons of nuclear weapons. If that's not scary, and, that, and that's, I used to talk, I used to read about this long time ago, 10, 20, 15 years ago, but it was always like a fringe. It's not a fringe anymore. You have half of the GOP members believe in that. You have, you have, you have Israel uh, having like a, something called the Temple Institute that is flying uh, perfect red heifers, the red cows, in order to be sacrificed uh, on 10th of April because it's the, so people will be purified and start building the, 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 the third temple. This is incitement of war. It's times of madness. It's a, yes, but it's made by the by people who are very powerful and who are very, they, they can actually end the world right now. And we were, basically we are led by a bunch of fanatics who have been telling us as Muslims and Arabs that your religion have some, has something wrong with it, within it. You're the violence people, you're crazy, and then you are, they're leading us into the end of times. It is crazy. Isn't it, uh, isn't it eye-opening that we uh, tend to, um, I mean, if you look back at history and look at the history of the Cold War and, uh, you know, starting from the first nuclear bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then you, you end up in a place where they were actually never used and this never really happened, right? Is that not a possibility in the world that we live in? That, you know, we're constantly fighting for more power, but that now the world is no longer a single power and that there will be ways where... Y yes, but, but now it's different because A, it is on a religious basis, which is much more fanatic and much more difficult to avert. And B, you have already uh, 
making enemies of everybody around you. You are you are bombing foreign embassies in other countries to drag them into war, like what happened in the Iranian embassy in Syria. You are you are constantly like showing the the world how evil you are and you don't care and you're inciting all of that violence and you're going to go in absolutely unchecked and where do you think this will end at a certain point people will react and people at a certain point people will fight back and it just takes like one one wrong move for the whole world to explode it is very scary Damn, this is not a political show, everyone. Uh, how do you how do how you, you can, how can you separate yourself from politics? How, how can you how can you speak about hope and whatever without looking at the rest of the world or what's happening? I mean, we're not living in in a, in a, in an isolated oasis, you know, from the world. But you see, the 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 thing about I, I never separate myself from politics. Mm. I I put as a mathematician, I take politics out of the equation because it's not a factor. It's like Stephen Covey talks, right? It is. It's within your area of concern, your, not your area of influence, despite what people really think, even in democracies where you're supposed to go and vote, okay? The people have no impact on policy whatsoever, right? And so if you want to Im- impact the world, you tell yourself there are 16 levers you can move to change things. This lever that's called politics is not within my abilities. I'm sorry, but like if you tell people that people cannot, people, you said people will not affect policies, right? Absolutely not. But policies affect people. 100%. Right? But, then, but then people have to react within means where if you pull the lever, it makes a difference. How can you pull a lever without using politics, which is something that is completely political that can change your life? And if, for example, if I live in a place where everybody has a gun and then the NRA is allowed because of politics to fund this, how can you do that? I think the biggest power in the world is economics. Yes. Okay, because all, all politics and isn't, are- And isn't economics the, uh, basically affected by politics? It is, but it also affects politics way more than it's affected by politics. Yeah, no, but I, I disagree with you because in a, in a country without mentioning names, you can actually have politics to ruin the economy because you have actually have, you have no transparency, you have no accessibility, you have no uh, accountability, and you can use the politics as a stronghold in order to ruin economics. But, but economics for, for, a, for a change are actually, is actually affected by the people. So, so you, when we started the conversation, we said that, you know, we, you go out and you speak and you say whatever it is that you want to say. And at the end of the day, the leaders will not change. If, I am a, if, if I'm a military dictator and you have a business, politics, economy, yeah. I go in, take your business, put you in jail. That is politics ruining your economy. Whatever I, economy you have, you cannot do anything to me. Do, 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 you, do you believe that any military force in the world can affect Google today? No, because Google became so big, it became political in itself. It became bigger than most of the GDPs I know, but, of most but countries. I understand, but like what I'm saying is, it's not necessarily the case that like economy, you cannot treat, and the thing is because Google have this kind of, a, of economical power, it made it able to change politics because they became political the, the, in nature. That, that's my point. Yeah. My, but, po- but, my, but, point, my point is, is that the entry to changing everything, if everything- And by the way, mm, Politics, I can actually make rules, tax rules, in order to cripple Google if I want to, you know, and I can actually drive Google out of the country. I can make Google change its uh, headquarters. They have changed already. Remember, remember when they were moving their headquarters because of, uh, because of the taxes? That is politics. That is actually politics affecting the economy. But, but you see, this is the point. The point is, can the United States, for any reason, live without those major economic superpowers? No. No, they can't. I am. I understand. But so, what I'm saying so what is, you, you, when you say I can, you basically mean I have the ability to, but I don't have the willingness to do that because it would affect my country negatively, mm. right? I think the, the you know the rise of AI is a very clear example of that. There I want to hear from you more about the AI because I know that you speak uh, uh, strongly about it, and I'm, this is something that I'm also like very worried about. You, th- you say that AI could be our. It could be. It could be our savior as well. And and how is it? But but are you are you optimistic or hopeful about AI, the way it's going? My, you see, there is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with abundance of intelligence, mm. right? The more intelligence you and I can have, can plug into, the more we can get to conclusions and work on things in this conversation. Intelligence is not a bad thing, right? The the issue with intelligence in abundance at the pace that we're creating is that it is another superpower. It's the mm. next nuclear bomb. Mm. Right, and so there is a, an arms race, a cold war, really, 
Hmm? For everyone, every company is competing against every other company to get access to AI advantages that beat the other company. Every nation mm. or every nation that is intelligent enough, mm. that's not bogged down in feeding its people, is trying to get access to AI before the other nation. Because mm. literally it is an Oppenheimer moment. The, the nation that will get access to AI in a way that is, that is superior to other nations will lead forever. Mm. Right, this is not an advantage that can be broken anymore. And how would AI affect us as humans on individual basis? If you live in a, if you are privileged enough to live in a first world country like the United States or in Europe, if your country became that, for, I mean, it's not even country; it's it's corporations basically, right? It's not really the country; it is the Googles and the Amazons of the world that will actually do that. If that happens, what, how would how would yeah, that affect us as human beings? You, you as an individual? Yeah. Would you believe me if I told you that we could have held this interview with one of my avatars and one of your avatars and none of us here? Yeah, I believe Today. that. I totally believe. Today. I, 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 yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I just, I, it's not far-fetched. Yeah, so, so, so the reality is that I- I mean, they're already using AI in order to put uh, voices and stuff. So they're, they're making me advertise for real estate uh, <laughs> uh, fakes, companies yeah, yeah. and deep, I already deep fakes and there are people, people no, putting but, my, my, my voice on the internet and using it. Yeah, one, one of the things I'm definitely considering to do on this episode is if I subtitle it or if I actually dub it, I can dub it in Arabic Yeah. yeah using AI. You would, you would not have said a single word in Arabic I have seen now like speeches from leaders from the Second World War being dubbed into English 100%. with their voices. Even uh, Egyptian uh, comedy plays like Madas Mushakhbin and Adil Imam speaking in English. It's just, yeah. it's mind blowing. Have, I, it's I, mind I have, and with their voice, it's mind blowing. I was, I was recently in an event uh, remotely in California uh, called Abundance 360. One of my dear friends, Peter Diamandis was uh, leading it. And, and there was an avatar made of me. Right, so there was me speaking and the avatar speaking. Okay, the avatar spoke more than me. Hmm? Uh, in my was voice, he, was he more intelligent? And I swear to you, I swear to you. Sometimes the avatar would say shit, and I'm like, "Whoa, I should learn to say that in the future." Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, so my question is: If I'm an individual, I mean, if uh, forget about the avatars, how would like my day-to-day -day life your be job, affected? Your job is going to disappear as a comedian, as anything. Mm. That's, this is the immediate, so there are, there are five major effects on humanity, okay? Mm. One, one is we're about to enter an era mm, where there's massive concentration of power, okay? So anyone who gets the advantage of a superior intelligence in any of the fields will lead that field forever. Mm. Because once you get that advantage of twice the IQ, right? If you, if you become twice as, be, as, as good as the next trader in the stock market, that's it. Mm. It's an endless advantage because the resources you're gaining will enable you to become four times better and mm. six times better and mm. so on. Mm. At the same time, you're getting a, a democratization of power. Very, very interesting. It's, it, it's the dichotomy of both. Some nations will become very powerful and some nations will become very weak. But at the same time, individuals like you and I, I kid you not, hmm? you and I walking out of here, we could place an order online, $27,000, get a, a DNA printer at home and I can print COVID tomorrow. Hmm. That, that's the, the level of democratization of technology, hmm? the level of democratization of you and I, I kid you not, in the car back to where we're going, hmm? I could write a piece of AI code that learns some form of intelligence that flips the world upside down, hmm. right? This will mean what you were talking about, population control. Because the, when, when, when people in so much power see so much uh, uh, um, possibility of the power being broken because of democracy of power, okay? I mean, the Ukrainians, when they fought back against the very first attacks of Russia, they used $300 drones, right? So that access to what used to be a $300 million weapon hmm, that can stop a tank hmm, is now $300 drones. With, a, with an explosive uh, shot on them, right? Mm. Now, that's number two. Number three is what, what I wanted this entire conversation to be about, the idea of the absence of the truth, mm. Mm? that you and I can no longer tell what is true. Mm. That if you, if you looked at my avatar in Abundance 360, and you were not told it's an avatar, you would probably say it's quite okay. This, Mo's improving his English a little, but that's it. 
right? So you, you can never tell the truth. That means that our human connections are going to be completely disrupted, mm. right? You and I, I kid you not, hmm? I could probably within a year from today have someone respond to my, an avatar respond to my WhatsApp and you wouldn't know it's not me. Okay, you may even, you know, if you've seen the movie Her, you may end up falling in love with that, mm. right? Uh, no, no, hold on, don't fall in love with me. But mm. you know, you can fall in love with an AI. Hmm? The, and, and then finally jobs. Already AI dating apps now. Dating apps, yeah. more yeah, than 100 yeah. million downloads, right? Uh, um, uh, the, the, the other very obvious one is jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone, people surprisingly don't understand. They think that AI is going to replace our jobs in the factories and in the driving, you know, fleets and cars and so on and so forth. Robotics will come later. Hmm? But if you're in a knowledge work, in an information job, like you and I, mm -hmm. I write books, okay? And I uh, sit with people and chat on podcasts. Mm -hmm. And I go to, to events and I speak. My, my craft is language. Okay, and knowledge, language and knowledge, ChatGPT beats me hands down every time, right? So, so every knowledge worker is going to be replaced. Within the next five years, there will be 10% of, of software developers left. Today, 70%. So we need to make a lot of money now. <laughs> we need to we, make more money we need now. To yeah? pay, we need to pay down our mortgage <laughs> as soon as possible. So, 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 so believe it or not, And then use AI to wipe out our debt. <laughs> believe, believe it or not, this actually is what people need to start talking about. Because you know what? Paying the mortgage? No, because, because <laughs> this new tech hmm, is the, if we use it properly, nothing inherently wrong with, with, with intelligence. Hmm. If we use intelligence properly, we may actually fix the world. Hmm. Right? The, 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 the advantage that people in power have today Hmm? is going to have to either grow in line, you know, in, 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 according to the AI, or the people will grow in, in line with the AI. Is it true that you left, like you were in an AI project and you left because you saw what it would have? Uh, uh, is this my podcast? Mm. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, I really want to, uh, this is very I, uh, interesting for me. I, uh, yeah, I, uh, it's quite interesting actually. So 2017, I basically, uh, realized that AI, that technology in general has came, come to the point where- 2017? Yeah. Five years ago, or yeah, no, yeah, seven yeah. years ago. That's, it, it yeah. went a lot further since then. Oh, you have no idea what we had in the labs then. Wow. Uh, 2018, I, I had my first video of the One Billion Happy video. Mm. I think it had like 16 million views or whatever. And it was entirely about what's happening now. Wow. And, and then, and then, You know, when I, when my first book Scary, uh, on the topic Scary Smart came out 2021, I kid you not, I went to all of my contacts in TV and I said, this is a very important topic. And the, the response that was 2021 was like, who wants to talk about AI? So when you see now what happens and, and gets out on the Twitter, like Sura or- uh, Sura's, yeah. Or, or AI or whatever, or like you see like the bees and like traveling between oh, the travels, oh, all of that. Every time people come to, oh my God, that's great. How do you feel when you see this? We had this in 2016. And why are we seeing this now? Because of the resources that you put behind. So let me not be, let me not be, not, not exaggerate this. You, you, technology is made up of two things. One is a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And the other is the resources you put behind it. Uh -huh. Okay, we found the breakthrough, the original idea of, you know, transformers, for example, which is powering ChatGPT and the likes today. Okay, Jeffrey Hinton spoke about that for years, since 2011, 2012. We had our very first view, you know, examples of it, the breakthrough, 2016. Mm. So, you know, once you see this, I'll give you a very interesting example. The very first, remember Google Glass? Yes. The very first Google Glass, hmm? was six kilograms. Mm. It had a projector on the head of the, mm. of the, of the developer and it had a, a, a desktop computer attached mm. to it, okay? But that was the breakthrough. One, once you did that, hmm, you knew that you can build it. And now, the, you see, uh, the, now you see all you of know, the virtual like, stuff. Yeah, and it's it. just tiny and it's a tiny computer and so on and so forth. Mm. Once you got the breakthrough, all you needed is the is the current wave of resources being poured on it. To make it applicable. Mm. To, make, to make it scalable, to make mm. it faster, to make it learn from 2.1 trillion images instead of 2.1 million images, mm. okay? And I think this is where we're going.
The, the, I, I, can we go back to you? This yeah, is, it's very. I think AI is much more uh, they're, interesting than me. <laughs> they're, they're, they're gonna kick us out now. So, yeah. so how do you, with with so much on your mind and heart, how do you wake up in the morning and handle all of this? You just gave me a lot of to think about now about AI. Now I don't think I'm gonna wake up in the morning thinking about anything else. And it's like, all right, let's so, go. I have a show today, but we're gonna die soon because of AI. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's gonna <laughs> die soon. So, so We're I, gonna be enslaved by machines. No, that's absolutely not gonna happen. Where's Sarah Connor when you need her? <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Yeah. It's not. I think what is going to happen is that the world is gonna change very drastically. Mm -hmm. Okay, but not necessarily to the worse. Yeah, Dis disruption is a good thing. Disruption, like you know, you've lived through so, qu quite a few of them. Yeah, I mean, as long as it pays the bills. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you wake up in the morning and keep going? How do I wake up in the morning and keep going? Uh, alarm. <laughs> <laughs> Very useful. <laughs> Set the alarm. <laughs> that, that, that takes care of the waking up part. Uh, I keep going, uh, well, I, 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 because you have to. I think uh, all of to. my life, I, 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 this is, I never did something just because I liked it. I did it because I have to, you know, they have no choice. Like uh, I wake up in the morning, I hate school. You have to go to school. I don't like studying, you have to study. Like my, my mom was a very tough woman, and she was always like, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll, be, I'll be like, come back with like, I'm, I'm the top of my class, mom. Ah, where's my <laughs> present? Where's my prize? It's like, you're doing it for you. <laughs> you're not doing Sorry. it for me, Habib, you're doing it for you. Yeah, yeah. So you, you get this kind of like uh, self-propelling motivation to do things for yourself and uh, not to expect appreciation or be applauding or whatever because the oh, the world owes you nothing. I think that is, I think one, remember when I told you about my, my bitterness and my anger phase? I think there's a, a type when I said, uh, I, I wrote a sentence on, on paper and I kind of kept it on my desk since then. And I said, like, you need to constantly remind your entitled self that the world owes you nothing. And when you get to that point, you 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 depart you part away from the victimization and the the self-loathing the self being sorry for yourself and wanting people to see what you're going through because at the end of the day, people don't care. People don't care. People and 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 you don't you and I think you really need to stop expecting validation from people because it doesn't work and it's never and, and and that that's not the solution. You need to be have the validation and the and I know I know it sounds cliche and the self love from within yourself because if you're not happy and you're not satisfied with yourself, there is not amount of praise in the world, validation from the world, or uh, or love from the world that can make it right. I can end on that. Man, that's actually a very positive view. Basically, you wake up because the world owes you nothing. No, no one will scratch your back. No Correct. one will. No one will save you. No one will give. No one will 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 give you stuff that uh, out of the, out of their good heart. It is only you and only you that can actually take care of yourself. And if that's the case, then maybe uh, for everyone listening, it's only you and only yourself that is going to change this to the positive. I think this must have been the most pessimistic <laughs> episode I've ever- Pessimistic, optimistic. <laughs> I've ever and, and, and no, this hold is a, on. This is a pessimistic episode with Bessie Muse of the Comedian, who's by the way on tour in Europe right now. Shouldn't you plug my freaking tour, the, dude? Hold on, hold on. Don't go anyone. Uh, where, where is the tour going? 16 so I, places. I, I'm doing, okay, uh, I, I'll try mm -hmm. to recite the cities in my mind. I'm uh, counting. Okay, okay, I best like- uh, no, uh, no, 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 look, see, see if I will l l l go in it. Okay. <clears throat> it starts on 6th of April in uh, London, the Apollo. Okay. Then uh, then 11th in Paris, 12th uh, Amsterdam, 13th Rotterdam, 14th Malmo, two shows, Rotterdam, two shows too. And then uh, 15, 16, uh, 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 Oslo, yeah, yeah. No, no, <laughs> I, I, I want Oslo, I wanted Oslo. Uh, Oslo, then Berlin, then Zurich, then uh, Munich, then Hamburg, then Antwerp, yeah. then Stockholm, London, 
and then I, um, and then Manchester, Dublin, Copenhagen, Paris, Birmingham. There you go. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I messed up the, the, the thing at the end. But like, anyway, uh, guys, just look at the, <laughs> at the show notes. We'll have a, a link to all of them. Uh, mostly sold out, by the way. I think we have just a few seats in Manchester or something like that. Uh, Birmingham is actually the one that I'm excited about. 4,500 seats. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's the biggest uh, theater in all of the tour. That's fantastic. So Birmingham, 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 baby. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 will, I will say openly, uh, not, not that he needs my... Uh, my uh, recommendation, but I have known Basim for a while, and I really think that despite uh, the sometimes the bitterness of his satire approach to life, he will tell you his truth as it is. And I mm. think telling you his truth is enough uh, honor to just say, this is how I think the world is. And I think if we uh, attempt to to become a little more interested in our truth rather than distracted by what we're told is the truth. Um, I think a lot of things will change. Uh, Bassem referred to a, a cult classic, Idiocracy. Mm. I would actually encourage people to watch that movie. Mm. It's such an interesting explanation of where we ended up as humanity, despite how intelligent we've become. I mm. uh, love you very much, Bassem. I wish you all love, the luck. I think, it's, uh, I think it is uh, amazing to see you uh, making so much change. And uh, I love you guys all for listening. This has not been our typical episode for uh, slow-mo. But believe it or not, something that I constantly think about and I want to bring up, not because uh, knowing that the world is about to become more challenging uh, is, uh, is to scare you. Knowing that the world is about to become more challenging is to prepare you and to ask you to assume your own role and your own responsibility in uh, trying to affect as much change as you can, even if it's just for the ones that are around you, that you love, your daughter, your your partner, whoever. And, um, uh, you know, this is part of our uh, mini-series on stress. And, uh, uh, you know, my, my big mission this year, Unstressable, is a million people out of stress every year. Not that a million people will change the world in any way, but it definitely is quite big for my little world. Uh, so, uh, so perhaps uh, remember that it's not about the events that life sends you, it's about the way you deal with them uh, that actually defines your future. Uh, whatever you do today, Take a little bit of time to slow down after this very intense episode. I love you all for listening and I will see you next time.